Hey, it's Scott. Welcome back to Spin Magazine's Lip Service. On today's episode, the iconic Mr. Paul Banks of Interpol. We talk about life in Berlin. We get into Butch Vig and the production behind Nevermind. And we talk about the fact that Paul has never seen Meet Me in the Bathroom still. We talk about early band names and the new album, The Other Side of Make Believe, his upcoming tour, and the stories behind Interpol's most popular songs. I think you're going to really enjoy this interview. He's a great guy, a really fun interview. And we end with five songs to get a party started, according to Mr. Paul Banks. Coming up in just a moment, Interpol's Paul Banks. Welcome back to Spin Magazine's Lip Service, sitting with my friend here, Mr. Paul Banks of Interpol. How are you, my friend? Not bad, thank you. Great to see you. I wore uh, black in honor of you, because you always look great in black. I just, it's funny, we just ran into each other not long ago on the street. I think you just moved to Berlin, I think you said, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, I've been in Berlin since 20, since Christmas 2020, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. In the pandemic, like I was flying to Edinburgh March 12th, which was like the day that the travel bans were yeah. announced. Um, I have a UK passport. I was going to visit my then girlfriend and uh, I wound up just staying in Edinburgh for the majority, like the first eight or nine months of the pandemic. I just stuck around and uh, and then she and I moved to Berlin at the end of 2020. Did you just fall in love with Berlin? Because, you know, I've always known you as this quintessential New Yorker and we've known each other for, I want to say, at least 10 years or so. Yeah, I mean, I knew of you way back when because I feel like Abby and you knew each other in like 2002. Yeah. Do you know Abby Drucker? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's so, so funny. I forget I forget all the connections we have. Yeah. But yes. In fact, I just saw her... I feel like I saw her for breakfast about two months ago, weirdly oh, enough. Yeah. Yeah. She's awesome. Yeah, she's great. Um, so yeah, I think we've known each other for a long time, known of each other for a long time. Uh Berlin, I always loved touring there. I always loved like the street art and the fashion in particular. Um, but you know, this time was actually for my fiance who wanted to get a job in Berlin and not stay in Edinburgh. She's half German. And um I do love it there though. And it's it's interesting because I stay I still have a place in New York and I come back often and I love New York City. But when I get back here, it's not like a sense of what am I doing living up anywhere but here? You yeah. know, I actually really love Berlin. It's a, it's a nice way of life, actually. But I do love the fact that you can run into people on the street in New York. Like we ran into each other. I hadn't seen you. You were on the show like four years ago. And like I said, we've known each other years. But just those run-ins in New York, those daily run-ins are what makes New York special to me. What's life like in Germany for you now? I mean, it's got to be a whole different vibe than New York for you, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I have a an, a baby who's eight months old. Yeah, congrats old. on that, by Thank the way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of it, when I'm home, a lot of it is just, you know, being a dad. And, um, I mean, I cycle around, I cook a lot. I have a pretty, like, domestic chill life. And I box, and I have, like, multiple trainers and gyms that I go to. And actually, because I'm living in Germany, um, one really cool thing in Berlin, um, I had... You know, I took up surfing a while ago. I was going to say, because there's no, is there surfing? In, there's no surfing there. So, <laughs> And I mean, and also like, yeah, I mean, I could go to France and the, yeah. I mean, there are places in Spain too, but I just don't, you know, I'm used to surfing in Panama exclusively. Um, but what I discovered in Berlin is there's this like facility called Wellenwerk or Wellen, Wellenwerk. <laughs> right. And uh, it's like an indoor pool wave. But it's like not like, you know, the Kelly Slater one where it's like a giant thing with like a locomotive and stuff. That it's thing's like, insane, by the way. I know. I want to go yeah. so bad. This is like a pool with a with a padded bottom and a slope. And they just jet water up the slope. And you get on a surfboard and just like ride. It's like, have you ever seen those dudes, like those people um, surfing rivers? Oh, yeah. Where they just go back and forth sure. on that slope. It's like basically a man-made one of those. And it's fun as shit, actually. And it's kind of awesome. like a good fix. So, I mean... You can get anything you want, really, I think, there. And yeah. uh, and it's a very, like, it's just culturally, it's artistically cultural and cool. And, like, the fashion's cool and the yeah. kids are cool. It's they like, have these weird sex clubs I always hear about. I've never been to one. but Great uh, sex clubs. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. I mean, you, it's funny because there's bands there, too. I mean, like, Rammstein is so huge mm -hmm. there. In yeah. Europe, they're playing stadiums. And they're huge here, too. But it's funny how music translates in certain countries differently, right? There's artists that are, Rodrigo, as an example, is this artist that you probably know, like in South Africa, they did that mm. movie, Searching for Sugar Man. Oh, about yeah. Him. And he, he was literally like Elvis in South Africa. And here he was like a janitor. So it's interesting. I mean, is Interpol big in Germany? Um, I mean, I think, yes, ish. Ish. Like uh, probably comparable, 
I don't know. I don't even know if I could say comparable to the States, but like Berlin has always been good to us. Hamburg's always been good to us. And we actually just kind of made it our beeswax to travel and tour there very early on. We actually hit Europe and like France and Germany quite often in the early days. So I think we've always just had a pretty good fan base there. Because I feel like, you know, people that like craft work and a lot of those artists would love or do love Interpol. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, you just actually played two nights at the Beacon Theater here, by the way. Yeah. We're drinking this uh, this thing I think you asked me, by the way, just to digress. This is this like clarity shot, uh, Magic Mind that I use. It's one of our sponsors to be transparent, but mm -hmm. I love it. So uh, it's no, ca it's like a very little caffeine, but it's like, it's what I drink every day, like mental alertness. It works. So yeah. do more, stress less. Exactly. Says. So if you, uh, if you see me really jittery, it's not because of this. It's just because I'm also drinking coffee, but it's a great product. But, um, but you were saying, you know, we, were, we were talking about the Beacon Theater. We did like, there was two nights that you just did there. Um, how are those shows, by the way? They were really good. Um, to be perfectly honest, I got, I got pretty sick right before those That's shows. That's right. Yeah. You got the so, flu or something. Yeah. So I was, uh, the first show in particular, pretty fucked up. Um, and then the second show, uh, much, I felt much better. You know, I mean, our crew said that they, they were both pretty good shows, but uh, for me, I think I was a little focused on how shitty I felt the first one, but then the second one, you know, when you kind of like break through and are feeling better and there's yeah. that like release of like, I don't feel great, but I know I'm getting better now. So the the second show for me was was better. And the beacon's so iconic, so that it has to be great. It's really nice. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually really surprised. Is that the first time you played there? I think the first time I've ever been there. Mm. And uh, I... For the layout, it's like a nice big space, even though it's one of these theaters with like the balconies that go up, which are often sort of on the smaller size, yeah. but that's like a pretty, pretty sizable room. And yeah, it was really great. It's awesome. Actually. And by the way, you're doing Crew World, I think, next year. That was just announced, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Have you ever been to that festival? I don't think so. I don't think so. It's for those of you that don't know, it's this iconic festival of like 80s and 90s bands, right? They have everyone from like literally like Simple Minds and Blondie to you guys. So it's like spans the... Uh, there's all kinds of artists on there, but yeah, are you I, excited about it? I think I don't know who's on this lineup that you're playing. I but. Like Duran Duran. Oh right, right. Duran Duran might yeah. be one of the headliners. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. There are a couple bands in particular that I am very interested in seeing. Yeah, I can't remember off top. I mean, Duran Duran. I was yeah. a fan, you know, since since I was a kid. Some of these bands you see and they're and they're so great still. And some of them, I'm like, I wish I just kept the memory. <laughs> like, I love Morrissey. I love the Smiths and certain, you know. But I know that like sometimes you go to see Morrissey and he plays no hits, and I'm just like, play one Smith song. Like, I don't right. need a, a whole two hours of songs I never heard of. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I saw some of the footage from the last Crew World Festival. It looked great. So excited for that. So there's so much to get into. We'll talk a little bit about the record and where we are today, obviously, and also your history. I think last time you were on the show, we probably went through some of the history, but it's so interesting to me. I was actually watching Meet Me in the Bathroom just to revisit it because I saw it. And Albert Hammond was on the show just recently and we were mm. talking about it. Albert never saw it. I assume you never saw it still. No, never read <laughs> it, never saw it. <laughs> it's funny because it shows some of the early footage of like brownies, Back, and I think some of the early gigs you were even playing like acoustic guitar. Yeah, like solo stuff. I heard solo stuff. There. Yeah, right. Yeah. Is it because I'm sure the memories are great, but I mean, was it that you just don't want to relive it, or you feel like that's? I know you like to focus on the future, but also, I mean, it feels like that was such an iconic time in music that it's hard not to like reflect on it with a lot of joy. I would imagine. I or, mean, or no. I, I feel like, yeah, like <laughs> the next person's neuroses is, you know, probably unfathomable to, to you, yeah. you know, like the reasons why I'm uncomfortable with like early work. It's like, yeah, very probably, I mean, maybe we're all the same in the sense of like, it's like listening to yourself on an answering machine, but like amplified, like yeah, I hate that. a thousand times. It's a little bit, you know, you're like, do I really sound like that? It's, it's like, a, it's a quit. It's kind of, it's kind of like that. I think also as a musician, like I'm sort of. I'm like a, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, but then I've never really striven for perfection in performance because it seems totally out of reach. So I just sort of like relax about it and kind of let myself be a little bit loose along the way. Yeah. And I think there's just like, it would sound like shit to me if I listened to it. Mm. And I think, uh, or quotes from today would just sort of hit me like the answering machine thing. So what happened with the, with the book though, is that Lizzie Goodman's a friend and she had been one of those journalists that has always been around from the beginning of the early 2000s. She's super intelligent and super cool. And when she approached me and said, I'm gonna do this book and it's gonna be the oral history and yada yada, I felt that like what I'll do is I'll speak to her without a filter because I actually genuinely trust her. And I genuinely think that if someone is gonna be the person to make the kind of authoritative documentation of that moment in time, it's her. Um, and so I kind of like 
didn't think too much about what I was saying and just kind of like let it all hang out. Um, and I'm happy that it had that, the success that it, that it got. And similarly with the movie, I just felt like I'll just participate because I kind of feel like it all seems like in good hands, but that doesn't mean it's going to be something comfortable for me to watch. It's so rare, by the way, to have that footage and then all those bands, aside from maybe the moldy peaches that I feel like probably didn't do that much after that, but mm. all the bands did so well, right? Well, Walkman had a harder and time. Walkman, yeah. I mean, they. I think that they will gain notoriety as the years goes go by. Yeah. Um, and I know they just had a really good tour, yeah. but you know, they they had stopped. I think in like 2010, and I think because they never really. I mean, what is success, right? In my opinion, they were hugely successful because they're fucking awesome and they yeah. made amazing records. But I think they didn't really like reach, you know, the popularity heights of the Yaz or the Strokes. But isn't it interesting when you think about the last 25 years in rock music in New York City, it still remains that yourself, the Strokes, LCD, Yeah, Yeah's, you're really the only bands that have really come out. And I mean, you can't really think about other bands in the last 25 years that New York has like spawned, right? I, I really can't think about mm. it. It's, it's interesting because I was trying to think about it the other day. And Are you talking about like since then? Or since from... then, since then, there's not a lot of, when you think about the last 25 years in rock music out of New York City, there really hasn't been a plethora of other rock bands. Really, right. it's, yeah. you guys are still holding the flag. And, you know, music is at a different place right now and we'll talk about it, and, you know. But just to rewind a bit, I mean, I'd love to kind of take it back to the beginning. This shows a little bit about your journey and obviously we're going to take it to present day. But talking about early on, I always feel like it's strange to think that like Aerosmith was the first band that you learned how to play music to dream on, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so talk to me about how that happened. That your dad played music, I believe, right? Um, yeah, my dad was in a skiffle band, which is like the genre that I guess whatever preceded the Beatles or like maybe the Beatles did skiffle before they switched over to the, you know, not a like, genre that a lot of people talk about. Yeah. Skiffle. That's <laughs> anyway. So he was a, you know, he was a guitar player and like a DJ and he then later in life just kind of took to collecting guitars. So we had a lot of guitars around the house. It was a very, both my mom and my dad loved listening to music. And so we had a lot of vinyl and, you know, um, I think it was like a musical appreciation house that had guitars lying around. So when Dream On hit me at that like just pre-adolescent moment in time, I was like listening to classic rock compilation records and that song was on one and it just sort of just, yeah, kind of like kind of awoke something in me, I think. And it was like, uh, and also around that same time, Led Zeppelin was doing it like uh, a couple of um, Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You. Yeah. And um, I was really into Jane's Addiction but anyway, Dream On actually was before those, and that was like the first thing that made me want to pick up a guitar, and it had to do with this sense of like, I can't listen to this song any more intensely, but I want to participate with it more, so I want to learn how to like play it. And then I like grabbed one of my dad's guitars, and he actually showed me how to play the opening lick. You only learn the opening lick. Yeah, I only ever, <laughs> I only ever learned the opening lick of anything. And that's, that was really the only song you learned how to play, and then you really just started writing your own music, right? Yeah. Interesting. And so, and also there was a phase, I think early on too, like a Michael Jackson phase, like a lot of people had, right? When you were a lot younger. Yep. That was, well, the first, so when people used to say like, what's the first tape you ever had or what was the first like yeah. CD you ever had? And a so track from, or something. <laughs> for me, it was Thriller was the first tape, the first piece of music I ever asked for and, and got was Thriller. And then a band that just came up on my Instagram feed the other day um, that does need way more recognition, but the first CD was um, Living Color. Mm. Cult of Personality. Yeah, they were on the show. So was Jane's Addiction. I feel like these are all guys I've chatted with recently. Yeah, great band and deserves a lot more recognition yeah. for sure. Faith No More, a friend and I were just talking about. That was yeah. a band when I was a kid where it was like, you know, because they were on MTV with that song Epic. And it's like, that's one of the greatest songs ever. Definitely. You know, that, and that was just one of those rare, beautiful moments of like great art being on TV and like, you know, reaching the masses. Our show today is brought to you by the fine folks at Sonos. I have to take a moment to talk to you about my favorite speakers on the planet. First impressions, open up the box, some of the sleekest speakers I've ever seen in my life. Sonos has hands down been my favorite speaker brand for years, especially as a touring musician myself. I've used all types of speakers throughout my career, and I gotta tell you, Sonos beats them all for sound quality and ease of use. I recently got the Beam sound bar and the extra subwoofer, plugged it in, super easy to use, and I gotta tell you, my room fills up with sound like no one's business. The Beam sound bar is the clearest dialog, such insane bass, especially when hooked up to my extra subwoofer. My homeroom shakes. It literally fills up my bed with so much sound. Lately, I've also been using the Arc sound bar for my living room TV. It's super easy to connect to. I was able to seamlessly hook it up. It's sleek and it blends right into my space. 
The ARC soundbar has really changed the way that I watch TV and movies. I'll have some friends over, I'll hook it up to the extra subwoofer, and it really helps to create that intense surround sound. The design is immaculate, it looks great below my TV and living room, and my favorite thing about Sonos speakers is how easy they are to use. You can set them up in under 20 minutes or so. The sound's incredible, they look incredible, and they are the best gift you can buy for anyone. Head over to Sonos.com to learn more and find gifts for every listener on your list. And your family moved around a lot when you were a kid, right? Yeah. Yeah, we were, I was born in England. We moved to the States when I was three. Um, I was in Michigan and New Jersey. Then we moved to Spain when I was about 12. And then 15 back to the US or 16 back to the US for a year. And then I moved to Mexico City and finished high school in Mexico City. And how did that affect your musical journey? Um, I mean, guessing yeah. you were exposed to all these different kinds of, you know. I think it, I bet, and I bet it's probably similar with a lot of people. It's like, it's not so much the place I was, it's like certain people turn you on to certain things. Sure. So there was like really seminal moments for me was there was this like very cool skate skater dude in my high school who was much older who introduced me to Velvet Underground when I was in Spain, when I was like 12. And then there was a neighbor that introduced me to Suicidal Tendencies. And when I was like seventh grade, a friend in Spain introduced me to Danzig. And uh, so that kind of those, and obviously other things were introduced to me along the way, but they just didn't stick. But like, those are like moments in time where I was like, holy shit, this music is fucking dope. And that was, that was people in Spain. Um, and then when I moved to Mexico, my friends were just really tasteful, hip dudes and, and gals. And I uh, was introduced there to like the Pixies and... Frank Black. Yeah, Frank yeah. Black and a lot of a lot of music. Blonde Redhead, um, Archers of Loaf, you know. Then, like, the kids movie came out and that whole soundtrack sure. kind of blew my mind. And at a certain point, like, the inevitable Nirvana, right? Nirvana was before, when I was in Spain, too. Yeah, Nirvana when I was... Uh, shit, man, when did, when did Nevermind come out? So, I feel like it was, like, 92 or 93 or something. Yeah, so I was, like, 13, 14 when that was breaking. And then... Uh, and and I you was saw obsessed. them, right? I was the biggest fan. Yeah, I was the biggest Nirvana yeah. fan. Uh, and I saw them on the In Utero tour. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah I front, think I, I, was at the, I was at that tour too, by the way. Incredible, right? Really? Yeah. How yeah, lucky were we? Pat Smear, it was like really early Pat Smear yeah. era. And did you know at that point, because obviously at a certain point it was like people were like Pumpkins fans or Nirvana fans, but did you know when you saw them that that band would have the impact that it would go on in the legacy? Did you, or were you too young to really realize that? I mean, I was young, but I was a big fan like of, you know, Jane's Addiction and, um, you know, Zeppelin and lots of music and Nirvana just hit me like, you know, this is the most essential thing that I've ever heard or yeah. experienced. I think it was like to be fucking 13 and see the video for Lithium. Crazy. When they're like, it's like a Reading or Leeds for performance, festival performance, and he jumps through the jump kit at the end. Yeah. And it's kind of like, I do, you know, I feel bad for people that don't get to experience that. Definitely. Like a band like that arriving on the scene and putting out videos and music like that when you're like at that age of just being like... This is it. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. yeah, it was a great moment. Talk about a band, by the way, that really their sound changed so much with a new drummer. I mean, they initially had Chad was their drummer, and then when they got Dave in the band, I think their sound changed completely. So, and is it? It's not just the drumming though, but it's the vocals. Yeah, everything changed. Yeah, I mean, no, but because Dave Grohl is such a great singer. Oh yeah, and he was such yeah. a guy. Like the BBs yeah, the and Nirvana and... are kind of like you know maybe under underrated. Definitely. I just saw I saw one of these things where it's like. Um, is it Butch Vig or Albini that produced um, Nevermind? Butch Vig did Nevermind. Yeah. He was um, on the show not long ago, and it was an incredible conversation. Just hearing about the initial cassette tapes and, you know, the first time he heard Teen Spirit, like what he thought, because having produced that, it went, I think, you know, later on, Kurt would go on to say he thought the production sounded like Motley Crue, which is interesting because uh, it's the record that made them huge. But I think, I guess he really hated the production, like later on. I mean, okay, that's really interesting. And I, I kind of buy that, and I'm not surprised surprised to hear that I think on the thing that I was watching it was showing Vig double the vocal exactly on like in bloom mm -hmm. and then double Dave Grohl and it sounds fucking awesome but because like their voices are incredible and he said the thing about like I got Kurt to do it because I told him John Lennon, John Lennon would right. do it yeah. and it's like that's the greatest like <laughs> yeah. that's how you do it man. Yeah. that's how you get any musician to do it um, yeah, I think for me it's <clears> funny because I was I was I think seventeen. I moved out to LA, and my first gig I ever played, I opened up for Jane's Addiction. Wow. So Jane's was the first band that I opened up for. It was at the Park Plaza downtown. It was Jane's Addiction and Gene Loves Jazz About. I don't know if you remember that band, but another kind of glam band from that era. But I was like Perry and Dave. I'm like, this is it. Like this is the future music. So yeah. it was pre Nirvana, 
But I, I mean, they they went on to become huge. But I think obviously, like we spoke about, Nirvana changed the game. So it's interesting that you got to see them play. And I, there was a story I heard that you you tried to give like Kurt uh, like yeah, a cigarette, cigarettes. Yeah. Right. I just on the on the Nevermind tip though. I because I so I do think the production is really polished, and so I can see what he's saying about comparing it to Motley Crue. The thing is, the songwriting is so dope, and the kind of you know like. So f to me, I listen to Nevermind. I'm like, the production's perfect. It's like one of the greatest records ever. Yeah. But I can kind of hear what he's saying if you know like what genre he's coming from, like what, you know, grunge was in that moment in time. It's got like a lot of sheen to it, Nevermind. Um, I think what's great about In Utero is that it gets like more raw. There's it's like dirty. some of the it's most raw yeah. shit. And they wrote some of the most ominous rocking music on In Utero. That's like the, the greatest stuff they ever did for me. Definitely. Um, but yeah, so when I went to see him, like I was like, you know, smoking cigarettes and stuff. At and, 13. Yeah, 4, 14. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I put one of this like Spanish brand of cigarette called a Fortuna in a paper airplane. And I was like, here, Kurt, like <laughs> have a Fortuna. And I threw it. I mean, one of his roadies did pick it up at the end of the concert. <clears throat> it's crazy because I always say this, but having played with Courtney for years, like I feel like he had, you know, there was a connection. They were living together. And I feel like especially a couple of those early whole records he was around during those times. So I, I feel like I get to perform songs here and there. I did get to perform songs that like he had a hand in or something. Mm. He was around. So it's I'm probably one of only a handful of people that get to say that it's such a incredible experience. And I feel like I have like an outer body experience when I perform kind of doll parts in some of those songs. Cause yeah. like, I don't know, but I feel like his spirit like lives yeah. on through those songs. So it's pretty incredible. Um, Take me back for a moment. At a certain point, you got into hip hop and obviously all the way up into, you know, working with RZA now and things like that the last few years. So where did your love of hip hop come in? Like, how did that start and where did it start for you? Um, I mean, the hip hop stuff even predates Dream On, et cetera. So when I was really young, I first moved to Spain and I had this just sort of like mischievous buddy of mine who was a little bit older and he was way into like Too Short and Two Life Crew. And so when I was like 10, 11, uh, I was listening probably in 12, 7th grade. Um, and we had like a, <laughs> yeah, so we had a, <clears throat> me and this buddy wound up having like a fictional hip hop duo partnership. <laughs> what was it we, called? I can't remember, but it was like really, really foul and just like childishly like, <laughs> right. up, you know, everything obscene and yeah. just like. Um, it probably exists on YouTube somewhere. No, well, <laughs> I mean, I wish because what was cool about it is that like my friend kind of would would do fake raps and we would both draw like imagery associated with like who our characters were. But I actually would do these kind of like mixes where I would sort of cut up hip hop songs on a dual tape player. And uh, and I was just making these kind of like, yeah, mixtapes and like mashups of like Eddie Murphy and Two Life Crew and amazing. Um, there was like a lot of like interesting kind of like pop rock, uh, pop hip hop stuff. Like there's this song called Menti Rosa that came out. Mm -hmm. Do you remember this one? No. Ain't got nobody. It sampled like a Santana. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Oh yeah, and, I know this uh, one, of course. And it's uh, <laughs> shit like that. I was into and this guy Kwame. Um, <laughs> Did you think at a certain point you would you would end up in hip hop? No, or? that's interesting. Like, no. And I think similarly, like early on in my career, like people would say like, or it's like, you know, I never ever really aspired to do what the things that I loved were doing because I think I kind of reacted to the way that those things made me feel rather than like, you know, how it was being done to make me feel that way. Interesting. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like when I wanted, when I started making music, it was about creating feelings rather than creating like a, a sound. Yeah. So talk to me about how you met, you know, the other members of Interpol. At a certain point you moved to New York. I think you were what, 15 or 16 or something? I mean, it was freshman of college. So I don't know, 18. And you had a job at like Interview Magazine, like the hippest fashion magazine in the world, of course. And you're going to school. And all of a sudden you see Carlos and he looks cool. And was it just this instant chemistry or had you known about the band? Because they were they were a band before you joined them. Yeah. Well, so it's really Daniel who you should talk to someday. Yeah, you yeah know, who's, for sure. Uh, he's, a, he's a really interesting cat yeah. uh, and with the, with the music scene as well. Um, kind of has an interesting history. But uh, yeah, it was Daniel's band and he had he had scouted Carlos. They had a class together at NYU. I had done a summer abroad in Paris after I was in Mexico City finishing high school. I went to Paris for NYU semester abroad before my freshman year at, at college. And Daniel was doing that same summer abroad in Paris, but at the end of his senior year of college. 
And uh, I had my guitar when I was over there. And, you know, so he, you know, and we had some classes together. So we weren't like super friendly, but Daniel had clocked me. So then I moved back to New York and I was living at the 3rd Avenue dorm on 11th Street. And Daniel was living on 13th Street and 3rd Ave. Um, and so we'd see each other around. And then one day he said, you know, he saw me on the street and he's like, would you like to come and watch my band rehearse? Um, and so I went and Carlos was in there. And Dan and, was singing initially too, right? Uh, I don't think anybody was singing. I mean, Daniel did some singing on the early, on a couple of early songs, but I don't think the idea was that he was going to be the singer. He was just filling in until you came along. Or maybe he would have. <laughs> I mean, maybe, yeah, if I hadn't come along, maybe he would have been. Mm. Yeah, maybe. Um, but Carlos had been living in my dorm and I'd seen him walking around my dorm in like a monk cassock and like, you know, <laughs> right. like total goth attire, just like. He walked like he kind of like floated like a vampire like across the courtyard. And, like I just <laughs> he remember. did look cool, by the way. He had a, he had a very and distinct he just, image, and he owned what he was doing. Yeah, it, to a degree that was like so theatrical and intense that I kind of like I love characters. Yeah, and so even though that like wasn't where I was coming from with how I was dressing or acting, I just had a lot of respect for like this guy because like this guy's fucking crazy. <laughs> and then I walked into this rehearsal room and there he was playing bass and they were like playing PDA. You know, one of our first singles. They had like the you know, the majority of that instrumentally written when I joined. And I wasn't really looking like Daniel wasn't like my closest, you know, we weren't even friends. Um, and I wasn't looking to join a band, but they were just that impressive that I was like, oh, okay. Well. And, and by the way, a slew of bad band names early on. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was like the French letters and Las Armas or something. Yeah. Was that when you were in the band or before you were in the band? Well, that was me. That was, that was yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you come French, up with those names? French letters my friends came up with. Some of the Mexican hipsters came up with that one and submitted that. <laughs> Um, cause my Mexican bros from Mexico city moved to New York and went to film school at the same time that I went to NYU. And that was like my, my peer group. Um, yeah, Las Armas, that was mine. Daniel had Teleferique, which was a good one that we didn't go with. We had Bruno, my keeper, which is a reference to this book, Tin Drum that I was like way into at the time. By the way, some of the reasons maybe why a band's successful or not, like a band name, right? So like obviously Interpol just connected. It's such a great band name. But at what when you heard PDA, did you know you were like, this is the band that I need to join or were you still sussing it out in a way? Well, I, like, I didn't want to be in a band. Mm -hmm. I looked at myself more like if anything, I wanted to do like a Leonard Cohen kind of thing. Right. Um, I could see that. And I... But it was just like, that's good music. What they were doing was just really good music. And I think it was interesting, like, even though I was only like 18, 19, 20, you've, if you play guitar as a teenager, you meet a lot of people to play guitar and you hear a lot of what people are doing. And it was just like what Daniel was doing was just like, you know, on a whole other planet from any guitar player that I'd heard, not in terms of what he was doing technically, but like what he was writing, you know, it was like, that's just very good writing. So I was like, ah, oh, I'll fuck around with this. And at that point, were you aware of the strokes? Had they started to happen? No, no, because we started early, man. We we first started writing in like 96. Our first show was in like 98. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the strokes broke until like 2001. Yeah. And you get together, you send your demos out to all the labels. Nobody showed interest early on? Yep. And that again was sort of testament to Daniel having some experience in the biz because like I was, you know, any label that had rejected our demo, uh, you know, went on my shit list. <laughs> right. and I, I've told this story, but like Matador was on my shit list because they'd rejected like multiple demos. Yeah. But Daniel had been, you know, um, on the low, sending them any updates along the way. And I remember like he came to one rehearsal and he was like, yeah, we got a rejection from Matador, but Gerard Cosloy like wrote the rejection. Yeah, and, and, and so what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, he, and he said like, but, and he said like, stay in touch. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> right. fuck them. Uh, <laughs> But I mean, he's right. I think it was uh, it was definitely Daniel's a very good, persistent dude, and he was very savvy. So I think we uh, made the right moves early on. And in watching the movie, you kind of you pool all your money together and you go to England. I think right where a lot of bands ended up taking off the home of you know the Smiths, New Order, all these bands. And and was that the point where you're like, even if we don't have any money, we're going to get together and try and break out of London because New York, you know, it was it was difficult back then. I think maybe we went to London because we got a Peel session. Mm. And that was just like, That's so let's just make it work. Hit. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and also like I didn't have, I, I I would meet people early on who would like be in bands and talk to me about like, I remember like being out and someone telling me about how they had a manager and that they were kind of like talking a big game. And I remember kind of being struck by the way that like, sometimes people try to get into like an artistic field, like music, like strategically, 
or they think if I get this and then I get that, then this is going to happen. And it was kind of, I was in a, in a much more organic phase. Right? Yeah. Just kind of like, I really want to do this. Mm. And I, and I had this like suspicion that if you like really commit to doing something and you do it long enough, people will even just be interested in like, why are you not quitting? Like, what am I not seeing here that's making you think that this is like <laughs> right. worth doing for like five years running with nothing, you know, happening for you. I just had this like sense of kind of like, you got to do it not because there's an outcome that you're looking for, but just because you've got to do it. Mm. I love this story about Erlon. You got booked on this like metal fest crucifix. Oh, or yeah. Something. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the, yeah. the festivals that you played and probably a very weird bill early on for you. I don't know if it was like black metal bands, Interpol or whatever it was, but were you at that point where you're like, all right, well, this is the weirdest thing that's going to happen. So we need to kind of stick it out because it can't get any worse than this. I mean, no, I was just getting like just drinking beers with Carlos and, and fucking <laughs> around. And I think it was actually this tour manager, Stephen McDougal, that we had in that age who was like the guy, the same guy who pulled a plug on an early Mexico City show when the floor was going to cave in. He made the exact. So he's like good at making calls on behalf of the band yeah. and like in that that black metal festival. He's like, we're not playing. <laughs> it's like, let's just go. So you didn't play at all. We didn't play that festival. No. <laughs> at what point did Matador come around? Because obviously you were persistent and you kept it up. And then at a certain point they did come around. Yeah, it was after the Peel session. I think uh, the story goes that Chris Lombardi was on vacation in Europe in his car and he like listened to the Peel session. And I think Obstacle 2 came on and that was the one that he said, okay, let's do it. Because that first record is undeniable. I mean, people, you know, the story goes, as you know, you know, you have your whole life to write your first record and six months to write your second record. So you had been a band for what, five, six years before the first record. Yeah. So you had all those songs accumulating and then you go to Connecticut to record the first album. Is that just because you didn't have, the funds weren't there to do some in the city or just want to be isolated? Uh, I think it actually had to do with the fact that like Sam was also the guy in the band who had some experience in music. And so he was sort of plugged in and had done some recording with another band at Tarkin Studios in Connecticut with Peter Cadis and just sort of vouched for the guy. And Sam was the only guy that knew anything about gear or engineering or anything. And so I think we just kind of were like, all right, let's go work with this dude that Sam likes. And, uh, and yeah, the rest is history. And we all, you know, Peter Cadis is is a legend. Yeah. It was a great, great time working with him. Was there tension in the studio for that first record? Well, it, well actually, because we had this dude, Gareth Brooks, also was like first initially going to mix it. And uh, in the end, like half the songs on Bright Lights were his mix and half of them we remixed. And I think a little bit there was like, to me, what went a little bit wrong is that I do think we were being pigeonholed in this post-punk thing and this like sort of revival, you know, framing that was totally not on my mind. <clears throat> like not where I was coming from. You know, Carlos was way in a new order and and this stuff. And we all like the cure. Enjoy division, I guess, right? Yep. Um I feel like I feel like Carlos might have been more a new order guy. But it's same Peter Hook and both, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh and anyway, it was just I, I think Gareth was kind of like doing some things that like made it sound a little bit like like he was really doubling down on the part of our sound that does come from that era. But there was, you know, for me, you know, like there's Pixies here or right. there's like, you know, I don't know, John Spencer's Blues Explosion is something that is in my DNA or like Lou Barlow or like John Frusciante. And it's kind of like, that's not all this reverb and kind of like lushness of like Cocteau Twins or whatever. Um, and so I think it was just kind of wasn't exactly jiving with what we thought we were. So I feel like if there was a Bright Lights, you know, the Gareth Jones, I think a lot of people would probably love it. It's probably dope, but it didn't really feel exactly like who we were. So we redid half of them. And I think, you know, it's kind of like pulling it back into what we saw ourselves as rather than what some guy who was had mixed those bands mm. and was like putting that same filter on us. When you started to hear the mixes of that first record, were you like, this is undeniable? Did you think that it was going to connect as well as it did with the public? It wasn't, it wasn't so much listening to the mixes. It was like in rehearsals and writing. And it, again, wasn't so much that this is going to connect with the public because again, I really like am a believer in like, you can't like strategically succeed yeah, do in, the, in the arts. Yeah. You know, you have to just do your thing. Yeah. But I do feel like, as I said, I didn't really want to be in a band. So for me to be playing with musicians, it has to be because they're fucking dope. Yeah. And all and the guys so, in the band were incredible. I mean, Sam, so unique. I mean- Talk about a great drummer that really fits the music. And Carlos had his thing. And Daniel, obviously, you all... They're it, fucking all... The chemistry. Unbelievable musicians. Yeah, definitely. And like, I was in awe of Carlos 
in awe of Sam, in awe of Daniel. And so it was one of those times like it's, I don't know who said it first, but like if you're the least talented person or the least smart person there, then like that's good company <laughs> right. to be in. Yeah. And I kind of always felt like that because it would be insufferable for me to feel like someone else was the weak link. Yeah. Like I don't want to be fucking around <laughs> with that. But feeling like that I don't understand how these guys do what they do. I just know it's fucking dope. That was what gave me confidence. Not that it was definitely going to reach people, but it was that like if anything is worth doing or anything has a chance of reaching people, it's working with people like these guys. So the record comes out, it does connect with people. Obviously, no one really sounded like Interpol back then. Again, you had the Strokes, you had the AAS, but you were doing your own thing, and then mm. Napster happened. So how did Napster affect what was going on with the band for around the second record? Yeah, I mean, the second one leaked. Um, but again, that kind of like didn't really... Again, like I was just getting fucked up and playing rock music. I, yeah. I wasn't that concerned about those things because it spoke of like there was excitement around our band that people wanted to like get it early, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it was interesting, I think, just watching the precipitous decline of like money that could be made in the music business all of a sudden, like right when we came onto the scene. But then I go back again to like, I wasn't doing it for the money anyway. So yeah. it was more like, you know, the fact that we get to be taken seriously, the fact that like, I remember a conversation with Daniel after the first record, maybe around the second record, which was along the lines of like, you know, Maybe if we play our cards right, we don't have to go back to our day jobs. <laughs> right. That's and all like, you were, that's that all was, you wanted to achieve. Yeah. And so like, it wasn't this like, you know, where it was also a really interesting moment in music because like Metallica kind of stepped up and actually like complained about what was happening with Napster, yeah. if you remember, right? And like, they got fucking Killed. shit on yeah. for that. That did not go over. And so it was just like, you know, the times were changing and it just kind of seemed like, hey man, I'm just going <laughs> to focus on making music <laughs> and not, I don't know. I, I love the stories, by the way, behind these songs. Like, I know that you don't love talking about lyrics so much, but if you look at a song like Slow Hands, is there a story behind the evolution of that song? Um, that was one. I mean, the one thing that's probably noteworthy is that, like, the verses and the and the music were written together in re the rehearsal room, uh, and I didn't have a chorus until we were recording the record. So we had, like, the instrumental chorus where it was like, you know, we'd, like, play the song, and I'm like, yeah, the chorus is fucking awesome. Like, this feels so good that there's, like no vocal, you know? And I think as a guitar player, that was something that would happen to me in the early days as I get caught up in sort of how great it just felt and sounded to just to play as instrumental. And sometimes vocals came a little late for me. So there's a, like a lot of early music that I wrote lyrics and vocals at the last minute, like the entirety of Take You On A Cruise I wrote in the studio. Uh, I had no vocals for that for like the years that we were writing it. Wow. Um, and Slow Hands, I wrote the chorus like the day before we mixed it. Um, and there's that thing that singers do. I forget the terminology when you, it's sort of gibberish that you sing. Yeah, Romulan. That's Romulan, what he calls right? it, yeah. so, so I guess there was a lot of that going on until you actually landed but on no, it. But so that would have made it easier. But there wasn't even that. Mm. Well, I'm saying for slow hands, there wasn't even gibberish for the chorus. There was like jack shit. Nothing. It was just like the chorus hit and like, you know, the guitars pick up and it was like cool. But yeah, there was no, there was no vocal. And then I wrote... Yeah, not, e not even gibberish. I was going to say, besides like the Peel sessions, was there a time when you first heard, you know, Interpol on K-Rock or one of the stations that you were like, wow, it's so great to hear my music on the radio early on? Not that I recall. It just started getting into the DNA. People just started, just you just knew it was clicking because I guess the shows were getting bigger and bigger, right? That, that was point? it. Yeah, the first tour we did in the States in a van and then just getting to every show that we booked and it was always sold out and like people were giving us like paintings of the album cover <laughs> right. and stuff that had just come out. Yeah. And it was like, that was really, really crazy. And like that, that was a cool, you know, you know, really memorable rock and roll time. I think for me, like one of the cool things early on was we did a video for NYC with this guy, Doug Aiken. And uh, we shot it like in the Mojave, like in an airplane graveyard in like night vision. And I think that was like an early instance of me feeling like that it's a song that we've done that I like. Because also like the other thing, like there's like a bunch of songs even on the first record that like I didn't like or I felt really? I hear all the problems even at the time. Yeah. And then there was like a few songs on the first record where I was like, okay, like there's the new, there's Leif Erikson, NYC and like those ones I know they're good and hands away I know those ones are good so all right and then the rest of them like have qualities like say hello to the angels and anyway so for me it was like we had a video that was dope for a song that was dope and that felt like a good moment of arrival although a couple of years ago you did the 20th anniversary of the first right that had to feel great because I'm sure now when you play those songs in, an, in its entirety it must feel great because you realize what an epic record that is and the second a lot of the records by the way thank you there's seven so. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, 
No, I'm super proud of the first record too. I just think again, it's like a unique experience. It's like the guy doing the vocals and my particular type of neurotic dislike of my own work. Yeah. And when you think about at a certain point, you know, you go on to make a couple of records, Carlos leaves the band. How has the band's sound changed for you now? Because obviously this is years later. I mean, there's there's like there's there's a few different types of changes. Not all of them would I choose to enumerate. Um, well, you're playing bass, so that's one thing. That's yeah. Well, but there's just like there's you can focus on what is lost in the absence of Carlos, or you can focus on what is gained in totally. the new sound. And so I'll focus on what is gained in yeah. the new sound, which is that I think, I think especially with El Pintor, like the last record Carlos did with us with the self-titled, and he was really pushing things like, I don't want to be in a rock band. I don't want to be in the genre of rock. What did he want to do? Uh, I wanted to become an actor, but he also, I think, was sort of like, the whole genre was beneath him in a way. So he was trying to really like push us towards classical and like kind of like experimental classical and just really, really like really theory heavy, challenging arrangements. I can't picture the Interpol classical record. Well, if you listen to the self-titled, there's some songs on there. Like there's a song Always Malaise that's just like fucking insane. Like there's yeah. like a chordal change moment where it's like, but and still, basis to, to of rock around though. it. But then there's songs on that record that he had written that he was still in the rock vein, which is like Barricade. I think is on that record. It's a really rocking song. And there's a song Success that I love on that record. I think Lights is on that record. Yeah. Um. Yeah, Lights is on that record. Anyway, it's um, it was just kind of like very sophisticated to the point of being a little bit like alienating to even me at times. Mm. And that was where Carlos was coming from. And when that, when he left, it was kind of like, I like dissonance, I like edge, but I don't know theory and I don't even know how to make something like as challenging as what he's trying to do. So like, let's just like make it rock and like sound good. And like, let's like write things that are hooky and yeah, just like, it, so I think that we kind of snapped from going like really left field back towards just something that was a little bit more focused and concise and rocking in our fifth record, El Pintor. And I think that's one of the things. And it's just been fun for me over the years, kind of like exploring my rhythmic sensibilities with Sam. So as a bassist against Sam, which is something that I have a different, I think, sense of rhythm than what Carlos and Sam would do. So I think that, you know, me and Sam have done some really propulsive shit, like uh, All the Rage Back Home or Tidal Wave, I think have a really good groove to them. Yeah. Talking about the the latest record, of course, it came out about a year and a half ago, you know, The Other Side of Maple Leaf, but the process of writing that record, you were just talking about how you interact with Sam. Was it much different for you? Because I know you're all, you all live in different parts of the world now, I think, right? Yeah. Then that was, you know, and that one was also, we were separated by the pandemic, but um, yeah, that one was different because we, Daniel would send out tracks, instrumental guitar and piano tracks, and I would treat it with bass and vocals and then send those ideas to Sam and then Sam would like write a beat. Sometimes I'd say like, Sam, if you're having a hard time coming up with a beat, then like mute the bass and just try and write a beat around what Daniel's done. And then I'll rewrite the bass around what your beat is doing. And that kind of like passing, you know, game of telephone, I don't think, it's not that, you know, it's, I think we wrote a really cool record that's really unique to those circumstances. And so it has its own sound that I think is a function of those circumstances. And I think in general, it's m more fun when we're able to jam together and write. So I kind of look forward to that process again for the next one. But I think in a way, you know, it's like you, you know, you make lemonade, which is what we did during the pandemic being apart. And I think it actually does like evoke, like we were able to do some things that we wouldn't have done if we were writing together on that record that mm. make it kind of exciting and interesting to me. There's some there's some really weird shit on there, like a song called Greenwich on our new record. Uh, there's some odd stuff that we wouldn't have let the production stay so subdued if we were in the room together. But I think doing some subdued production is really kind of cool and refreshing for us. So I think it was nice that we leaned into what the circumstances were informing the music to do. And it's not a concept record, so to speak, but it's about the idea of truth versus fiction and storytelling in a way, right? Yeah, I mean, it was like, it was, this was at the height of like the anti-vax and kind of just all of the things that have been 
in recent years with like the election denial and like anti-vax stuff. And I think there was like this interesting thought of like realizing the way in which like people can be seduced by stories because either reality is too dull or because they kind of like, or realities are like, reality is like cold and boring sometimes and stories make things make sense. And so there's like the susceptibility towards simplified fictitious versions of complex realities mm. that I was like finding it very interesting the way in which like we've, we're losing track of baseline reality that we all share and that it's now it's kind of like out the door. It's I don't gone. know where the fuck we are now. Well, honestly. now it's just gone. Now <laughs> yeah. it's like you don't it's, live in a society where everybody sees eye to eye anymore. And it's yeah. like, it's pretty nuts. And it's all a function, I think, of like social media and and certain cults of personality. Um, Maybe that's why you moved to Europe, by the way, right? It's, it's probably... Well, I mean, it's the same there. Yeah. Same there. You have a lot of like weird shit going on in yeah. Germany as well. And so I, for me, it was just like this idea that like... Yeah, that meaning has really changed and like the bedrock of civilization has been kind of undermined. And a lot of that has to do with just sort of like the lack of faith in objective realities. Um, do you have a favorite song now that you've been able to play this record and, you know, for the past year and a half or so? And sorry, and I don't want to sound like, like snooty or, you know, it's certainly not condescending because I also kind of like, I, I understand, I think it's sort of like beautiful the way that we want fantasy and story yeah. and, and meaning. So it's not snooty where I'm, what I'm trying to say. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I am like embrace all, you know, yeah, it's just a weird world. attitudes. Yeah, yeah. It is a weird world. Um, sorry. Was I was question? saying, is there a fit now that you've had a chance to perform this record for about the last year, year and a half, is there a favorite track live that just comes to life for you that you love playing? Yeah. Totes, uh, yeah. into the night, not passenger. I do like passenger a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, but it's a little bit less viscerally exciting to play than Into the Night, which is like a song that has like a lot of rhythmic. It's, I, Into the Night is just a banger for me. I'm really happy that we wrote that one. It's, it's a great record, by the way. Um, looking back on your discography, like seven albums, you know, how do you feel about it now? Are there records that you're like, I wish we'd have done something different on that record? This is my favorite record. Do you have a favorite record at this point? I don't have a favorite record. No. But, Yeah, and there's things along the way that I would do differently, but I think that, you know, you live and learn and that's that's really what it is, right? If you haven't, if you look back at things that you did and feel like they were perfect, then maybe you haven't really like moved on from wherever you were at that moment in time. So, you know, generally I'm proud of all of them and uh, there's definitely things that I would change probably in all of them. It's probably hard to pick a set list out of so many great songs at this point for you, right? Um, or is it easy? Yeah, it's pretty easy. I mean, yeah. also like nowadays I can sing the whole catalog. So like I had a little phase where I was having a hard time, but uh, now I'm kind of like down for, for whatever's clever. So Daniel usually does the set list and I'm just sort of show up and sing them. <laughs> right. uh, are you, is there a lot? I know next year you're touring, by the way, you're doing a lot of shows in Europe, Cruel World, but are there shows that you're excited for next year? We're going out with the Pupkins again. Amazing. Yep. And uh, that's fun. You know, that wasn't a band that like I... Um, I didn't grow up kind of studying them or being obsessed with them, but it's fucking amazing. They're amazing live. Yeah. And like, I really respect Gorgon's songwriting a lot. Yeah. It's genius, really great, by the way. Great songs. Man. So that's going to be all next year. You'll be touring Europe with them. Uh, that's a chunk of it. And then we're doing some Latin America dates by ourselves, uh, some U.S. shows. And I think that's, oh, and then we're doing like, I, I, I don't know if it's secrety stuff, but like some, there'll be some stuff later in the year too, next year. And more music with RZA, more DJ gigs. I know you do so much. We were just talking about it before you got here. Like how much can you actually do? There's another band you have, right? So are there, is there more music with RZA that you think you'll do? Um, I think we will. Yeah. I think we will. I think it's one of those things where it's like, uh, it's just going to require some motivation and some and some hustle. And so I have this project, Muzz, outside of Interpol, and yeah. I have a project that I started in, in Germany, the un, as yet unknown, uh, unnamed project. But there'll be a record there as well, actually. So there's like another new thing coming. Amazing. You're in like five bands. I know. <laughs> well, we do this really fun thing at the end of the show, Paul, which is our top five list that people seem to debate and love. And, you know, people on social media, all they do is – debate these things, which is kind of funny. Um, so and I, knew, I know you're a huge film guy and a huge film buff, so I wanted to ask you your top five films of all time. 
Started wow. with number five, I guess. Top five. Um, I was prepared for top film. Well, top, top five. five films. Well, and I'll give you, I mean, that's, I'm just going to give you five that come to mind. In no particular order? Easily. Or no, I'll, I'll, I'll. Okay, we'll start with five. Whew. Okay. I'll go with Moon for five. Haven't seen it. You haven't seen Moon? Haven't seen Moon. It's Danny Boyle, you know, Slumdog oh, sure. Millionaire. Train spotting. Um, Sam Rockwell. Mm. Avatar. Um, Avatar. I think so. No, Giovanni Ribisi's in Avatar. Sam Rockwell's not an Avatar. Sam Rockwell is, um, right? I don't know. Well, well, I'll fact check. Oh no, you, I know you're thinking Sam, um, the star of Avatar. Oh yeah, that's yeah. that's Sam, Sam like okay. Worthington. Yeah, Sam Worthington. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, yeah. No, Sam Rockwell is. Uh, he's one of the greatest, yeah, great. greatest fucking character actors great. ever. One he's of the great. greatest actors ever. Yeah. So he just carries this picture because it's like him on the moon yeah. by himself, and it's fucking on. You gotta go see that movie. I don't think I've seen it, but I'm gonna watch it. Um, Number four. Oh shit, man. Danny Boyle did Sunshine, which I'll say is number four. So Sam Rockwell is in Moon, but that is made by Duncan Jones, Bowie's son, did Moon. Great. So Moon is five, Sunshine is Danny Boyle. That's number four, and they came out around the same period. Have you seen Sunshine? I think so. I feel like I need it's, to revisit that or that's not. That's great. It's Killian Murphy, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Rose Byrne. Killian's having a year, right, Oppenheimer? Yeah, great. did you like Oppenheimer? I did like it. Yeah, I did too. I, I could have cut like 45 minutes off it, but mm. I still liked it. And Nolan's not like, I don't love his, like, his, all of his movies the same amount, uh, but I did really like Oppenheimer. Yeah. It's very pleasant great surprise. Movie. So we're on number uh, three. Yeah, we're on three. Ooh, I'll give you one. I'm going to go for Sits and Giggles. And it'll just like cover this actor as well, but Locke. It's funny, I've never seen half these movies, but I'm. And, and <laughs> you're gonna love all of them. Yeah. So Locke, L O C K E. And that is fucking Tom Hardy in a car driving from one town to another town. Great actor. So I'll definitely watch That's it. That's the whole movie. And there's not another person in the car with Tom Hardy. Mm. So it's Tom Hardy driving a car. Talking on the phone. He's the only cast member. For an hour and a half. <laughs> well, there's, you hear the other actors talk to him on the phone at times. And it's, uh, again, like, you got to see it. Okay. Fucking amazing. It's on my list. Number two. <sighs> it's really hard, man. I feel like you have a number one that's brewing in your head. So. Well, I do have my number one. Yeah. That one's covered, so... Okay, so then I'll, that'll make number two. I'll say Miller's Crossing for number two. That I did say. Great yeah. film. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. I think, yeah, real high point in so many ways. What a great movie. And then number one, I'll go with my the one I've always had is a Performance by Nicholas Roeg. Sure. With Mick Jagger. Yeah, and, um, great. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, now this is probably going to be an easy one for you. I would put Interpol on this list, but the top five New York City rock bands of all time. I'm going to put Interpol on because... I'm allowed to do that because I'm it's here. It's your list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Starting with number five. Um, all right. Well, with this, then I'm not, I'm going to take them out of worst to best. It'll just be your top five. Yeah. Just like, well, top five, and you can guess what order they're in. Okay. So cause I, I, I'm going to go. Sonic Youth is a New York band, right? That's a good question. Uh, I want to say so because I think Kim Gordon lives here, but I'm not 100% sure. But I feel like they are. I feel like they are too, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. So we, we can fact check that. But yeah. We, let's we, say they are. Let's say now. they are. Let's okay. say they are. Um, I'm going to throw the strokes in there. Yep. I concur. I agree. Um, Flux Information Sciences. One I do not know. Yep. They, were from, they were from the late 90s New York scene. Uh, Blonde Redhead. Great band. And I did have a fifth one. Well, I don't want to say the Ramones, but I feel like they deserve some spot somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go with it. I, just, I, just, I don't want to be like a poser, like I really like, you know, studied the Ramones, but I feel like I've studied bands that were massively influenced by the Ramones. Definitely. 
And last but not least, because you DJ too, and a lot of people don't know, you have a DJ name too, by the way, right? DJ Fancy Pants. DJ Fancy Pants. The top five songs to get a party started, according to Paul Banks. Ooh, boy. Um, Think about all your playlists, you know? I mean, I'm doing this it. is. Yeah. <laughs> so there's one, it's. But it's complicated because it's it's Ultramagnetic MCs, which is Cool Keith's first band, and it's Traveling at the Speed of Thought. But there's two versions of Traveling at the Speed of Thought, and one of them I find, like, I don't even know what's going on, and then one of them is, like, the sickest dance jam ever. So you just have to figure we'll out which one Number five. Which. Number four. Um, oh, boy. It's harder when you have to think of them on the spot, I'm sure. Because you, you, I'm sure you just pull up those playlists. and. I mean, a surprising one that like that I like to DJ um, is called Underwater by Ghostface Killer. And it's just like a, it's not like a dancey kind of song, but it's like it, you know, will liven the party up. And it's, uh, it's just a classic Ghostface Killer song. I think it's a Dilla production, but not sure. Number three. Um, I'll go with, speaking of Dilla, M.A.S.H., from his album Donuts. Um, okay. Number, we're on number two. All right. And so if I was DJing right now, there's a couple songs that actually I'm really vibing right now. And it would be, I got to put Kodak on there. Kodak Black? Yeah. I'll put No Flock in for now, which is like an older song from 2017. And there's some amazing... I could, I could spend the entire podcast talking about Kodak Black. By the way, the, the whole list is hip-hop. Almost. Yeah, I yeah. thought that's, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I DJ. That's <laughs> yeah, all I spin. Yeah. 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 That's all I do. That's what I DJ. Yeah. yeah. And number one. Fuck. DJ Fancy Pants, the number one song to get a party started. Um, Turn in Lane, Mike Jones. Boom. Okay. There we go. All right. Well, this is fun. We got to do it again. Is there a new record coming out at some point? Is there new music you're working on? Yeah. Well, as I say, there's uh, this Berlin project that I'm really excited about, actually. Um, I don't, not, not really a lot to share there, but uh, I'll, I'll share it in due time. Um, that might be next. I think Muzz, we're planning on getting together to do some writing. Interpol's going to do writing this year. Maybe in the same room this time? or Yes. Definitely. And the tour. We can't forget about the tour. Yep, man. I stay working. Yeah. I'm glad we can make this happen. Thank you. So great to see you, by the way. And hopefully I don't just run into you on the street in another four years and we can do this a little bit more regularly. So. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks, Paul. Mm -hmm.